Plants are trying to kill you. Disappointed! Okay, not really. But kinda. Let, let me explain. Do you have any aches, pains, gout, maybe some kidney stones or other symptoms that are getting worse instead of getting better? Well, it may be the food that you're putting into your mouth that's causing all the problems. And I'm not talking about this junk. I'm talking about this. I have two words for you. Oxalate poisoning. But what the hell's an oxalate? And why is it poisoning me? Meet Sally Norton, who from the age of 12 had suffered with several conditions with intense back pain, irritable bowel syndrome, you name it, she had it. For 30 years, she suffered. All until she figured out that oxalate poisoning was the root of the problem. So what are oxalates, where do we get them, and why are they destroying our lives, it seems like? We're gonna dive in. This is Road to Recovery Podcast. Let's go. Sally Norton, the oxalate queen, as I've heard you've been called several times. I hope that's a compliment. It's great to meet you guys and uh, get a chance to chat. It's great. Yeah, no, so we focus here a lot on the podcast surrounding mental health. And of course, we have yeah. talked about our own eating disorder past. And we've talked not too much, though, about plant toxins, which is something that mm -hmm. you specifically have been looking at, particularly oxalates for the last several years. If anyone knows your name, they probably know your story, but I'd love for you to kind of give a brief version of how this came to be such a large portion of, of your life oxalates. Yeah, it turned out I had no idea about oxalates despite having a degree in nutrition from Cornell University, mm -hmm. which is a major deal university here in the yeah. US, and a degree in public health and a lifetime commitment to like knowing how to eat so that I wouldn't be sidelined by bad health stuff. But I had bad health all the time. I started having back pain as a young kid around age 12 and arthritic pains and started having trouble studying, you know, and just continuously dogged by problems. And I did not figure out that my healthy diet was actually the centerpiece, uh, the centerpiece of this huge long list of problems. I did not discover that until I was 49. And, uh, and those of us who are in the health field and, and pride ourselves on knowing what we're doing professionally, you know, we're hard to teach. But once we really learn something the hardest way possible by destroying our lives and health, uh, some of us just can't get enough of explaining why. Why did I shipwreck with oxalates? What is oxalate doing to us? Why does nobody care about this? And, and how do I reach my fellow sufferers? I knew that I wasn't the only one. There had to be some other people who needed to know about this because you can't go to almost any health provider I don't care if it's a naturopath, a, a, maybe a, a, a psychic. <laughs> I have heard people say they're psychic, told them they eat too many vegetables. But generally, if you're looking for help, very few people in a position, a professional position to give you health advice know anything that's true about oxalate and have any clue the extent of damage it can cause. So I've been deep diving on this, but I've been interested in the toxins generally and mental health and even food addiction and addictions generally most of my life. I think perhaps because I was poisoned as a child, my mother was on a drug, I was in a bedroom full of formaldehyde, I, yeah. there was eating disorders all around me. I, I, when I was struggling with foot pain in college, I was eating nine bagels a day to cope and uh, one of the first friends that asked me about this oxalate thing and wanted advice on how to do it had struggled with a lifetime of uh, struggling with alcohol addiction and being a recovered alcoholic in a lifetime of overeating and food addiction and uh, she wanted to try this because of her struggles still ever going on with pain and so on and i was amazed when she called me flabbergasted that that feeling of having to have food, that, that constant, hungry, unsatisfied, ravenous feeling disappeared when she took out the high oxalate foods from her diet. Wow. So, I mean, I continue to have people come to me with things that I think, wow, that can't be. And then it is, it is, it is. And I, so I keep finding medical evidence for the mechanism that explains why when you remove oxalate from the diet, miraculous things happen to your health and why if you don't you're going to fall apart eventually 
Yeah, I mean, I've heard so many stories and I have a, a pretty uh, dear friend of mine who actually discovered that Oxalate was his major contributor to a lot of um, mental health just decline over the years, physical yeah. pain, he had tons of joint pain, tons of digestive distress. And all of a sudden he did, I mean, well, as we'll talk about later in the podcast, kind of how to taper off oxalates, um, he went cold turkey and he just started noticing everything kind of flared up all of a sudden, mm -hmm. uh, even worse, just like removing it all. Um, but then once he started tapering, uh, he noticed just his life literally just turned around. And it's amazing how mm -hmm. just sometimes just one thing can be this huge conundrum for probably so many people, especially in, you know, coming off the years of juice cleanses and celery juicing and medical medium, God bless that man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think a good place to start off, and it's, this is the, how it goes with every podcast I've ever seen you in, is uh, just for our audience that probably doesn't know out there and pretty much uh, anyone I talk to, I, I have this misconception when I go around thinking everyone knows as much about nutrition as I do. And when I mention <laughs> things, they should just know it. And when they don't, I'm like, what? You don't know what an oxalate is? You don't know what a lectin is? But no, a lot of people, a lot of people don't. So what yeah. is an oxalate for the, for the people out there that are just like, okay, what? Yeah. So oxalate is a tiny chemical that's all over nature that we don't even talk about. It's fascinating because if you learn the history of oxalate science, it's in a, one of the very original chemistry uh, molecules that in chemistry they use for all kinds of purposes. And it's been around, we've been using oxalate as a industrial cleaner since the 1780s. Oh. It's, it's, we use it every day. If you use certain cleaning powders like Barkeeper's Friend and Zud have oxalate in it. You can use oxalic acid to take the rust off of a radiator or, or pull the rust stains off your your concrete deck or your wood, or you can bleach fabric. I mean, it has all these uses. So mm -hmm. it's this little chemical that plants make. They use it for lots of purposes. It's really critical to many plants for their survival, reproduction, uh, their general health. They need it. And, and they also have figured out how to make weaponry with it. So a lot of the plants we consider edible, most of them are human inventions, by the way, that if you were pre, you know, 500 years ago or even 10,000 years ago, there just isn't a lot of plants that you would willingly give a young child because yeah. you'd be putting them at risk for emergency room visits yeah. or death. You know, a dog even eats your house plant. In fact, the, the plant behind me, surely if a dog ate that, we the dog would be dead because it's like yeah. toxins in plants. Yeah. Uh, but we're not really aware of that. So in the meantime, plants are secretly building oxalate and they're building it as crystals. And for example, in trees, they put blocky crystals of calcium oxalate in their bark, which makes great sense because it makes it hard for the beetle to drill holes into the tree and kill the tree. Some plants like a kiwi fruit makes oxalate crystals. This is calcium oxalate and plants build these crystals. There's, there's these different forms of oxalate. It's the little molecule that's two carbons, lots of oxygen, by the way, on that little molecule. It's very oxidative. Four oxygen molecules attached to two little carbons. Carbons means it's an organic compound. Plants make vitamin C first to turn it into oxalate usually. That's often the, the metabolic pathways. Then they add calcium to it and then they, they string the calcium oxalate up on these little sort of structures made of proteins to create specific shapes of crystals. And the one in the kiwi is a double pointed toothpick called a rapide. And they make them like arrows or blow darts and sets of quivers of like 200, 400 of these toothpicks in these little vacuoles. And when the cells get damaged, the, the plant can actually project these little blow darts that come with proteases and soluble oxalate molecules and enter your tissues to, to like tell you to back off, quit eating me. <laughs> and it, that can be really serious. People who have taken dumb cane, which is another kind of tropical plant that we use in the malls and houseplants, you can end up in the hospital for a week or more, unable to speak because it paralyzes your vocal cords because the immune reaction is so strong to the damage that um, 
that's why it's called dumb cane because it paralyzes your ability to speak. So plants are doing a good job of, first of all, I think that's, I like to think of that as inventing warfare. If you, if you can do quiverfuls of arrows and harm things that are way bigger than you that have teeth and claws and feet and can run and you can take them down with one drop of sap, you're doing pretty well as a plant. <laughs> so defense is usually what you hear about oxalates and plant mm -hmm. production for their stuff, but they also use it for many other purposes and tend to put them in seeds not only to protect the seeds, but to save calcium. It's like a pantry, this calcium oxalate they build, these crystals can be broken down later during germination and use the calcium as a cofactor and enzymes to help the germination process. So it's it's there's lots of reasons plants use it. We have not figured out uh, how to genetically re-engineer plants to lower their oxalate production, although there's been a lot of attempts at that, like spinach is a really high oxalate leafy green. And they've try and try and try, like, could we make spinach still function without producing all this oxalate and they can't? Kind of makes you kind of makes you question if we should even bother eating it then. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I, I, Definitely, if you start knowing the numbers and how much we can tolerate and how much we can eat, there are certain plants that we think of as food that probably shouldn't be thought of as food, in my opinion. After working with all these folks and really reading what the researchers tell us, which is a unique thing to do, by the way, we mostly like to just pass around myths and beliefs and things that sound good and sell magazines rather mm -hmm. than actually get to the true facts. It's very easy to repeat uh, inappropriate conclusions that once were true and really have been um, changed, you know, it, like our theories about aging even have changed, but people still think taking a lot of plant antioxidants actually does something for you or taking yeah, a lot of vitamin E and things. It's, it's really, no. in, it's really interesting. I've had a real evolution on, on my own thought about, about just health and wellness and kind of mm -hmm. uh, just watching doctors like um, people that I've, I know, fairly respected, um, like like Dr. Mark Hyman and all these people that promote these huge, just like amounts of of plant foods, which I mean, if it works for you, like I'm all about like you do you kind of stuff. Absolutely. But um, but it's just like I've tried to incorporate like lots of diverse plants. I've done like things like the Walls Protocol, which is like tons of greens, tons of greens, lots of kale lots of collards so like nine cups of these a day and like it just does not it just doesn't go down through me correctly <laughs> in the way that it might in the way in, in, in the way that it might a gorilla for instance um but, but i do find it interesting i believe that our own bodies create oxalates is that right yeah, it's a it's a easy it's a tiny chemical, right? So vitamin C can become oxalate in a plant. They use it to but it also just falls apart into oxalate. In fact, a vitamin C supplement may have oxalate in it mm. because the C just degenerates into oxalate. So there's mm. that's not the body making oxalate. That's when okay. there's too much vitamin C around, the vitamin C becomes oxalate. If you can't use it metabolically and it's just extra, it's going to degenerate and create oxalate in the body. But the body creates oxalate metabolically um, and tries not to. But these precursors called glyoxalate, um, glyoxal, and um, glycolate be, can be shunted towards oxalate by the lack of B1 and B6. Mm. Um, even though if you have enough B1 and B6, there's a certain amount produced in a normal situation that's about 12 milligrams a day. So, and that's a nice low amount compared to kidney capacity, which is 25 milligrams a day. So we're about half of the of our kidney capacity is used up by just normal metabolism, which is primarily coming from the breakdown of connective tissues because hydroxyproline and glycine and these amino acids that are connective tissues are the ones that end up becoming oxalate in the body. But if you're low in B6 and B1, the amount of internal production can be up. And if you have some genetic problems, there these um, nutritional imbalances might promote a little higher production. But generally, you're slowly cooking along with your liver metabolism, and your liver and your red blood cells produce 
oxalate. The liver does not remove oxalate, the liver makes oxalate, but at a nice slow pace that's within your capacity to handle. So that's generally not a problem unless you have a genetic disorder or deficiencies in B vitamins. Interesting. The one thing me and Ryan have actually heard a lot about is the pushback on this is that a lot of people actually say that there's not a problem as long as you obviously cook the foods long enough and cook them properly. But what is the actual science in that? Is, is that true or is there still issues with that? So that's true for lectins. Lectins are gigantic protein molecules mm -hmm. that need to be soaked. They're in your beans and fruit, but particularly beans and grains. You just soak those beans and grains for two to yeah. three days or more. I mean, the researchers say three and a half to four days, which is like, by then you've got a new plant. I mean, it's not yeah, even a bean anymore. Totally. Yeah. Sprout. So like beans don't work unless they're sprouted, <laughs> basically what the research says. And then you have to still use pressure cooker level heat mm -hmm. to really mm -hmm. kill the lectin activity. So that works for lectins. It also works for phytates, but for oxalate, no way. It's not degenerate um, the molecule or the crystals that the plants make. In fact, um, the crystals are so durable they're harder than your teeth, by the way. So, you know, eating them is is a corrosive, it's it's abrasive, it's mechanically damaging to eat a lot of crystals and can even wear down your teeth. And so uh, they sometimes find this micro wear on the teeth of old skeletons, you know, buried in the ground for the last 50,000 years from diets that were high in sweet potatoes or, or these yeah, the um, N1 isotope testing, I think that is, isn't it? Well, that, it's not even the N1 isotopes. It's that these, you know, the little rapide blow darts, these, these mm -hmm. toothpick yeah. molecules, they find them and the plants make different tip shapes and grooves and these different, they have, mm -hmm. there's like six kinds of rapide crystals. Now the ones we tend to eat don't have the grooves and don't have like fancy tips. They're pretty basic, like simple toothpicks. So they can tell what a little bit about what kind of foods these ancient people were eating and they can see they were eating a lot because those little toothpicks are wearing down your teeth. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's an aside thing. It, the, the cooking does not break down a crystal that will last 50,000 years in the ground. Okay, It does not do that. Yeah, now, yeah. there is the ion molecules of the simple individual molecules that also in the plant. And those are the most important of all because those can so easily get into your bloodstream where those big crystals, they don't get into your body. They just mm -hmm. abuse your teeth and your just, digestive tract. And then you, you know, they come out with the feces. But the, it's the little molecules, the ions, that potentially if you boil foods like broccoli long enough, you can lower the amount of oxalate down to half the, of what it was and make broccoli pretty safe by leaching okay. out if you throw out the water. But if you're sauteing, you're not throwing out the juices. Mm -hmm. yeah, if yeah. you're putting it in soup, you usually throw the raw food in the broth and you cook it and you're preserving all that. So no amount of heat will remove oxalate. And the, the soaking of the grains, nuts, beans, seeds, and so on, may increase the amount of the, the individual ion molecule because what you're doing is you're promoting the germination when you soak. So the point of the crystals in the seeds is to save that calcium. Now, as you're germinating, you're liberating the calcium, but you're also liberating now an oxalate molecule, an ion, and that's the one that goes in your body. So you're effectively increasing oxalate load when you soak nuts and so on, not reducing them. So people well, think phytates and oxalate and lectins, they don't have any distinction of these molecules and how different they all are. Oxalate is the a very hard molecule to eliminate from food, and it's even harder to eliminate from the body. Wow, that's, that's, that's that makes me uh, rethink a lot of what I thought I was doing not too long ago. Because I was, I was like, oh, I just boil all this stuff, and I was like, oh, that's not helping that much now. All right, well, good it'll help to know. a little bit with certain foods. Like, I recommend you boil your asparagus, you boil mm. your broccoli. Mm -hmm. Um, in certain ones that are kind of medium level oxalate, the ones like spinach that are outrageously high, there's no Get amount. You, 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 the only way to lower oxalate in spinach is to eat four leaves or less a day. If you get down to four leaves, you're down to like 50 milligrams instead of, you know, a, a cup and a half is like 450 milligrams of oxalate. But you remember, you can only handle in your urine, you can only handle 25 a day. If you're eating 500 milligrams a day from your spinach salad, 
you on a perfect digestion with perfect health, you're going to absorb at least 50 milligrams from a 500 milligram dose because you're going to absorb at least 10%, meaning of the ions, 10% of the whole oxalate load will get from your gut into your blood. That's what we mean by absorption, right? So 50 milligrams coming from 500 milligrams of oxalate eaten means you've doubled what your body can handle and really more than that because you've got endogenous production as well as we said. So spinach is an example of something that's out of the ballpark of what we're built to handle. The yeah. problem is as well, I see all the time, a lot of people are actually blending a whole bag of spinach for in their morning smoothie. It's, it's crazy. How many cups in a bag of spinach? Uh, a lot. <laughs> there's several uh, cups. Yeah, there's quite a few. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. there's probably, you know, on average about 300 milligrams per cup. And if it's like 10 cups or, you know, people are now buying, in the U.S., you go to Costco and you can get this box this is like mm -hmm. four pounds. It's this is mammoth yeah. box of spinach. And they do that every week to get enough spinach. Spinach is still really popular. I have a good friend who works at the grocery store for the drop groceries where you, you know, you dial in your groceries and they'll bring it to your car. And so she's constantly bagging groceries for people. And she's like, everybody's buying spinach like crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I used to buy those big tubs like you were talking about. Um, and I would use like one of those a week, basically. And now I don't. And so I'm happy about that. But um, <laughs> so something you, you so bought are your earlier. Kidneys. Your kidneys yeah. are going to get much happier because they're know, the ones who do the work. <laughs> you know, I could tell because I could tell I might have been developing some level of kidney stones because sometimes when I would urinate, it would be painful. And I was always trying to figure out why, because I was pretty well hydrated and all of these things. And who knows, could have been, could have been the spinach. Probably was. Probably was but, because you're you're forcing your your system to pee out too much oxalate, which starts turning on the immune system and you start getting burning. Yep. It does direct damage, which you know causes all kinds of inflammation. Yeah. Inflammation will always lead to pain eventually. Yeah, I mean, so something you brought up earlier that was, uh, I think, really important was the importance of like having enough B vitamins. So mm -hmm. I know somebody actually asked me to ask this question because we were having discussions about oxalates. Um, and it was, so what are, what are the main things you notice when you're looking like for someone's thiamine, B6, magnesium, and it's not functioning properly to prevent the endogenous production of the oxalates? There is, a, in the urine test, you could test for glyoxylate. And if glyoxylate is high, then you maybe um, have elevated production. But usually when medicine is looking for that, they're looking for the genetic defect. There is this disease that is very rare, like three people in, I don't know, a million get this rare disease. And it's often from families who are cousins marrying each other. Oh, you know, yeah. Kind of you know, so it's really rare, but it's a, it's a great area of research and interest. And so if glyoxylate is high in the urine, that might be an indicator that you don't have enough B1 um, and, and B6. Even B1, thiamine can also promote other precursors that become it. Like the glyoxyl is one of the precursors. Glyoxyl and glyoxylate are precursors to glyoxylate. And the glyoxylate is the one that becomes oxalate if you don't have enough B1 and B6. But all of that, you don't really need to know that. Um, basically, when I look at somebody and, and I look for, you need thiamine if you have any mental health issues at all. If you have any neurological inflammation and if you're basically a human being in the modern life, because <laughs> it turns out, according to the research, almost every pregnant woman is deficient in thiamine. We don't have enough thiamine on board to remain within a healthy zone of thiamine while pregnant. So that means a baby is getting born, you know, maybe deficient because the body will, the baby is sort of a parasite. The body will try to prioritize the infant development needs because you don't want to mess up a fetus. You can only do fetal development once. And so the body tries to parasitize the nutrients out of the woman's body, which is partly why her she goes into thiamine deficiency. But it does mean that we're all borderline. Everybody is borderline. And something like 85% of the population has nutrient deficiencies. Mm -hmm. The sad part is, is that oxalate is a great way to create deficiency. 
of many kinds, mineral deficiency, calcium deficiency, B6 deficiency, and per perhaps even other B deficiencies. Um, so that's a thing. I think most people should think about the right forms of Bs and people who are truly sick with oxalate usually need supplements to deal with it. And with thiamine, the research suggests with chronic fatigue, alcoholism, and other forms of um, brain function problems, often it's 600 milligrams or more of the new, the new B ones, the, the, what we call the fat soluble B ones. That's oh, sort of a, yeah. It's sort of a misnomer, but salbutamine, allothiamine, and benfotamine, those are the new, the new forms of thiamine that can get into your cells. And using those forms, you can start improving the B status of the cells and start improving neurological function and certainly lowering your chance of having excess oxalate production in the body. But you're also getting some antioxidant benefits from B1 and it's considered very non-toxic, so it's pretty safe to play around with B1 and B6 are both pretty safe. So we, as a precaution for people who are convinced they have oxalate problems, I almost always recommend B1 and B6. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Uh, ben Photamine is actually something that I take um, since I developed some yeah. some neurological issues about a year and a half ago was one of the one of the things on there. I know that there are people out there that um deal with uh when they go low on b6 then they start really feeling problems with oxalates because you need the b6 to kind of handle all that so that that's an important thing to mention too i would i would imagine yes, and the high oxalate in the body seems to make you b6 deficient interesting that, well, I, I, that I think one thing i was going to ask as well we know that obviously oxalates cause a lot of health issues but what actually is the case with mental health issues? Is Does that play a part as well? Because we talk a lot about both on this channel. Does mm -hmm. it play a part in your mental health as well? Right from the beginning of this diagnosis, which the um, this was the oxalate overload in the body was a medical condition that was recognized in the 1850s and remained a medical condition until about the 1940s. So Nearly 100 years, there was this disease, the oxalic acid syndrome, which started off as the oxala oxalic diathesis. And right from the beginning, back in the 1830s, doctors were noticing all these mental health issues. And that was one of the major signs of oxalate overload was they had digestive problems and they had these strange neurological problems that... Um, mood problems, lack of motivation, depression, negative outlook difficulty controlling their behavior, irritability. This has always been part of the syndrome of oxalate poisoning. And it makes sense in so many ways. First of all, your nervous system is so sensitive to toxins. Secondly, nerves need ion control to function as do muscles. Yeah. It's things like your heart muscle, the muscles that control your digestion, your, your skeletal muscles are all important. And of course, the nerves are controlling all that too. But your brain and central nervous system by themselves are in great harm, danger, if there's a lot of oxalate in the diet all the time. And you can get into motivational problems. And uh, now I recognize addiction can be a oxalate toxicity problem. So it's it's a standard, it's sort of a, the three major departments that was originally identified, digestive problems, neurological issues, which include cognition, mood, sensory um, and just general like energy levels and even coordination. If you're klutzy and clumsy, that's that's because your nerves aren't working like they should. Mm -hmm. So that then there's the other piece is this sort of rheumatological with all the arthritis and muscle pains and fibromyalgia. That's always been part of the syndrome. And then, by the way, you also get urinary tract problems, pelvic pain, uh, kidney stones, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no, I think I think that, that uh, the mental health part's really interesting, and I think something that our audience definitely can can take away from this uh, because this I only is quite mentioned a lot about, especially mental health yeah. being as, as such a big discussion as it is today. Even though it probably should be talked about even more, I think we often think of it as as sort of like it's your problem and it's 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 in here, and you need to do like the mental work and therapy, I, I would never like say, don't go to therapy. 
I think therapy has, has definitely merit. I love it. It's helped me a bunch. But it, it, I think what you do put in your body, obviously, plays a huge a role <laughs> in, in how your psyche functions. And it, it, just, it should be obvious on its face, but I don't think it's treated as that in the medical community often. It's often like, oh, you have depression, so okay, go see a therapist kind of thing. Let's not address mm -hmm. the way you eat and all these other things that are probably playing into the de depression or anxiety or a lot of these other things. Um, and so, like you also mentioned, oxalate by now is obviously much more than just what you often hear associated with in the medical community as yeah. oxalate kidney stones. Because that's when you when you look it up and you go to uh, like a WebMD or everything, it's always about the kidney stones as like mm -hmm. the major disturbance. And that is, a, that is one of the many pieces to what oxalates can do to your body. And I, one thing I was curious about is because it's calcium oxalate kidney stones. Um, and calcium oxalate is just one of these forms. Um, how do our levels of calcium affect the oxalates we uh, consume and produce? And like, do low levels of vitamin A, K2, D, magnesium, do these affect this like balance uh, in our well, body? Well, calcium is a really important topic. And if you, you know, if you go back to the fact that the ones that the oxalates that get into your bloodstream are primarily the individual molecules, which is a charged ion. It has at least one negative charge and it can have two because it's the oxygens on two of the oxygens on those carbons have little hydrogens. They drop off. That's why it's an acid because it can drop off these acids. So that tends to form these um, bonds with minerals and the calcium and, and oxalate love each other. And once they hook up, they are committed for life. They really don't come apart easily. And that's why that's the predominant form you find in soil, you find in the plant crystals, and that you find in the body is this calcium oxalate. So if you eat a lot of calcium with your meals, or, you know, you could just start with the fact that a lot of the calcium in a plant that has high oxalate in it is calcium oxalate already. It's the crystals, it's mm. ions, whatever. So we just say there's a lot of minerals in something like spinach, but we don't say, oh, and by the way, it's all just oxalate and therefore it isn't actually yeah. nutritive. So there's the big lie that vitamin, that vegetables have a lot of minerals because they have a lot of minerals and they also, many of them have really high oxalates. So you're not getting the minerals they claim are in these foods when their oxalate comes for the ride. You also have the potential to lower your ability to use minerals with a high, especially when you put it in the smoothie or a soup, because mm -hmm. the liquid and that breaking it all up, breaking up all the cell components, the vacuoles and the membranes, and the walls and in plants, they have these walls. And so that's, you break up the walls, which normally you can't do well with eating with your teeth, but with a high powered blender, you can just liberate all this stuff. And so it's much more bioavailable. It's in a watery solution. So it's much more floaty. And the way oxalate gets in is it just floats into the gut. So in the old days, you ate it as a spinach salad or cooked spinach or cream spinach, and you had dairy with it. And if you had a high calcium diet in the old days, people used to like milk and cheese and thought it was fine and ate more of it than we do now. So, but now we're putting non-dairy, high oxalate nut milks in the smoothies with the spinach and this water. So that bioavailability goes way up when you eat a low calcium diet. And it makes a big difference. It's like a 40 point swing on a high calcium diet versus a low calcium diet and how much oxalate ends up in your body. So it affects your absorption rate a low calcium diet, terrible. So you need calcium as a binder. And when we're trying to get oxalate out of the body, we take calcium in supplement form to keep calcium in the digestive tract. We especially want it in the colon because the colon can be a place the body can dump more oxalate out from the bloodstream later. And if calcium is there, it'll help bind it and it'll move out in the feces. But with low calcium, the attempt to get rid of oxalate through the colon could be... Um, frustrating because it can just float around. It can still come in even from the colon, you can still absorb oxalate. So we need calcium. The fact that we're all on lower calcium diets these days out of fear of fat and cheese or fear of dairy generally is increasing the toxicity of the vegetables. Now, once you get the ion in your bloodstream, the ion depending on you know, the pH of the blood in the body 
tends to favor the single negative charge. So it's running around as a single ion. But if there's enough calcium around, it starts dumping its hydrogen, which means it's spewing out an acid, affecting your pH of your body. And then it's stealing calcium, which is taking away the alkaline mineral, lowering the alkalinity and raising. So it's very acidic, even in the first pass, but it continues to produce acidity as it accumulates and then deaccumulates in the body. So now you've got after meals, you're lowering the calcium content of your blood. Okay. And this is a period of about from about half an hour to about 10 hours after a meal. You've got a period where you're losing minerals from your blood because they're now binding with oxalate. So eventually that turns on the parathyroid gland, which tells the bones, hey, we need some calcium here. We need some alkalinity. We're getting acidity and we're getting low calcium. So give us some minerals, bones. And so you start turning on these immune cells in the bone that dissolve holes in your bone so that you can keep your ions correct in your blood. Because if the ions get messed up too much, now the muscles and nerves that run the heart, the pacemaker, gets confused and you get into arrhythmia or you get into you get into funny heartbeats, high heart rate, high blood pressure, palpitations, all kinds of issues with cardiac function. That's not good. No. <laughs> the body really doesn't like oxalate in the bloodstream because it can create problems all over the body. And of course, the bloodstream delivers nutrients and oxalate to tissues. And down there in the capillary beds, you've got this tiny, thin, fragile little capillaries whose job is to deliver oxygen and nutrients to tissues. And it squishes all the fluids out. It's just the red cells and the white cells smush through those capillaries. And you're, you're, send, you're smushing oxalate into the tissues. So after meals, you're, you're trying to get it out of your blood. The body's doing something to get it out. The kidneys start working like mad to get it out if they're capable of it. And the tissues start picking it up accidentally and maybe even on purpose in order to keep your heart working. So the calcium is super important. And one of the big problems with oxalate is a lifetime of oxalate will lead to osteopenia, osteoporosis, and other forms of calcium deficiency mm -hmm. diseases, which lead to autism, uh, ox leads to dementia disorders like Parkinson's and, and uh, autism. I keep saying autism, but I mean, because autism is another issue with oxalate. Oh, yeah. A lot yeah. of autistic kids do much better on a low oxalate diet and they start regaining um, independence and ability to follow through and follow instructions and ability to, to just be happier. Yeah. But, but what I'm trying to say is Alzheimer's disease and other dementia diseases are low calcium is associated with them and low mineral status is associated with them. But oxalate on its own is associated with neurodegeneration, a loss of nerve function, neuropathies, Parkinson's disease, oxalate can collect in the nervous system and all of that. So calcium and minerals are critical to protect us. They're also being leached out of the body as we're eating a high oxalate diet. So we know calcium is really important. The other nutrients you mentioned are like the fat soluble K and D. It's not as obvious um, the relationship to oxalate poisoning. And the, the, the interest in vitamin K is pretty new and it hasn't ever really shown up in the oxalate literature. There's no doubt that you should not be deficient in K. You should not be deficient in D. How we should correct those things is still up for debate but it's really important that we not be malnourished because the two only the real only two real causes of illness deficiency and toxicity yeah, yeah. and oxalate causes both and if you have either of them going on plus oxalate toxicity oxalates are going to get you faster and worse if you have gut inflammation oxalates will get you faster and worse and you can get so sick it can ruin your life and it can be devastating yeah yeah so, Given all that, is there anything people can do today regards, obviously, dietary and lifestyle choices that's going to reduce the impact that oxalates actually have on their body, or what do you suggest? Yeah, so this is the this is the kind of chronic problem. The short-term problems are, okay, you're losing calcium in the moment, and you're using up your bone health, and your electrolytes are off, and you're creating deficiency, and in some of those things, and you're affecting, you know, you're creating inflammation in your vascular system, and you're, if you get in your cells, you're creating metabolic problems because it interferes mm -hmm. with enzymes. It, it, 
it actually blocks the action of many of the metabolic enzymes. And so you can't produce ATP like you need to produce. So there's yeah. all that. But then this other piece of oxalate, because we eat too much, like the kidneys can only get out so much, but we tend to eat in volumes that are 5, 10, 15, 20 times what Guilty. our bodies can handle. <laughs> Guilty. Almond milk. <laughs> <feed>. yeah. <laughs> You're guaranteed to have oxalate deposits in your body. So once, oh, I do. <laughs> yeah, this is not a good thing because now you have persistent toxicity. You can stop the spinach, but the ox you have all that old spinach who's left behind these traces of oxalate, which can be in the form of oxalate lipids, which are not detectable in any way. Mm -hmm. So they get incorporated into membranes, which is not good. You don't want your membranes of your cells messed up because all of metabolism is about membranes. Everything that's metabolic is a membrane function. It's an enzyme on a membrane, whether it's a mitochondrial membrane, cell membrane, nuclear membrane, endoplasmic reticulum, it's all membrane structure. So you got oxalate lipids hanging around in your membranes. That's not helping your cells be healthy. Mm -hmm. But you also get these little nanocrystals, which are impossible to see. It's really microscopic stuff that's way, I mean, this isn't even, micro, it's below the wavelength of light. You cannot see it with normal light microscopy, but they can grow into these microcrystals and you can find them in the body, including in the thyroid gland, which is super common. Pretty much everybody's probably got oxalate developing in their thyroid gland, especially if you eat a lot of potatoes, peanuts, spinach, and these other high oxalate foods, which are nuts. And we didn't go into that a whole lot, but you can get a list on my yes. website that's an accurate yes. list versus the list the random yeah. lists online are inaccurate so getting it out of your body this is a persistent problem you're asking your immune system to go dig up hazardous materials over mm -hmm. and over and over again and it's very inflammatory and destructive to have to pull this out it doesn't always completely work so it, it can take 10 years or more to really um, finish the most obvious clearing process if you're like me I was a goody two shoes who loved her beet greens and her beets and her Swiss chard. Every as a little kid or nuts and it's eating real. a lot, <laughs> you know, and it's like the, the Christmas uh, stolen full of the citrus peel, the candy citrus peel that goes into cake, fruit cakes type things. Yeah. I love that stuff. And, and tea in high school, I come home and make a big glass of iced tea after school and these were not helping me. These were, I poisoned myself with oxalate and I'm clearing oxalate too heavily at, at seven and a half years. I'm still clearing oxalates. So this takes a while and you have to think of it like these little tiny, tiny little barrels of toxic stuff buried under an old gas station, right? So now you got to come out with your guys with your jackhammers and the hazmat suits because they got to dig up a toxin. That's your immune system. You have to turn up your immune system. You have to dig through tissues. You have to spew out. Now the cells, the immune cells will spew out acid and, and enzymes that eat up proteins, which breaks up these crystals tend to have proteins in them just like a kidney stone does. So basically we've got these nanoscopic, microscopic little bits of kidney stone in our tendons, our joints, our muscles, our brain, anything. It can, eyes, sinuses, teeth and jaw, saliva glands, you name it. The glands are really prone to the accumulation of oxalate, by the way. So this process, you don't want it to go too fast because what you're doing with your digging up your little barrels of microscopic garbage is you're now spraying it out into the streets to get it onto the train to take it out of this city. The city being your body. The streets are your blood vessels. You've got to put this the most toxic form, which is the ions and nanocrystals. You've got to put it out from these little crystal deposits, break them up, make a big mess there, then make a big mess in your vascular system, which increases vascular inflammation and can lead to atherosclerosis and other um, vascular diseases. And then you've got to tax your kidneys. So when it's high in your blood vessels and in your kidneys, you don't feel good. You tend to be acidic. You tend to be tired. You tend to have malaise or aches and pains and you have higher inflammation in the body. So this clearing process is a persistent challenge for your immune system that can last a decade. Wow, that's, that's wild. Um, I suppose kind of one, one other question that'd be worth asking is, um, there really, and this is something you've talked about quite a lot on other podcasts, is that there are not really a lot of good ways to, to 
test if you have an oxalate problem. There's not like an oxalate test. The closest I've been able to find is on like an organic acid test. You can check for oxalic acid. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of like the one reliable marker to keep an eye on in your urine? I know people talk about alkaline phosphate levels. I don't know much about that. I've had that mentioned to me before having low or high alkaline phosphate, but I wanted to, uh, are, there, are there certain markers we can look at besides just our like B6 status and B and thiamine status to maybe get a, a gauge? I think there could, I think there probably are markers, but no one's really solidified that into practice. So even if I could dig up the esoteric, well, so-and-so researcher says this and this, and there are mm. a number of little proposals in the research, but they're at this this like hypothesis stage of probably this is a reflection of that. And there's mm. plenty of it. But since nobody's looking for this disease, the big problem is, is that the uh, mythology in medicine is that as long as your kidneys are fine, you don't accumulate oxalate and you don't have an oxalate problem and diet doesn't matter. The same diet doesn't matter attitude even with something where we've defined you can only pee out 25 milligrams a day and be safe, be within human tolerance, and that a high oxalate diet is officially defined as super high as 250 milligrams a day of food oxalate. That's the definition of a high oxalate diet, and yet a cup of spinach has 300. Like one cup of raw spinach is already defines a high oxalate diet, but that doesn't count the tater tots or the potato chip or the peanut butter or the mm -hmm. Reese's cup or the almond, this or that, the almond milk, all of those things are high oxalate foods. So it's really easy to be in this high and nobody yeah. seems to be worried about it. This general idea that, oh, food is great. And we, we tend to focus on the benefits that we think are in foods. We think there's lutein and we think there's folate and we think there's calcium and iron and spinach, none of which are true because all that stuff is either unavailable or goes away because it's very um, fragile in terms of temperature and time. So until you go out and pick your spinach and keep it cold immediately. You can hold on to some of the lutein and the, and the folate. But if you put it in a room temperature box for an hour and then put it on a truck and move it, Costco, you know, you know, every place is sitting around, it's losing those things. But we have this benefits. We think we think it's there. In case it is, you should have a lot of it. And just mm -hmm. ignore the man behind the curtain and the toxicity that we have known spinach is toxic for over a hundred years. We've known this, but our mentality is that more is better. And if if it might have something good, you got to have it. Like we feel. And we're, we fall for this. We all have this sort of lack mentality and we feel like we got to get an upper hand and we got to find a little advantage. And our whole mindset is setting us up for trouble. Um, yeah. I'm getting off topic, I think. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think something that um, would, be, would be beneficial for people that they're just learning about this and would be beneficial to probably me and Tommy a little bit yeah. um, is, is sort of um, you have, like you mentioned, we're gonna put your website down in the description. You have lots of awesome resources that I, mm -hmm. I implore people to look out. But what are some sort of foods generally that, like we've mentioned spinach and like almond milk and nuts and peanuts and all these things a lot. What are some foods that we generally should avoid? And then what are some foods that we should feel okay yeah. about in the plant kingdom? Because I know you're a big proponent of, of animal-based eating because it does have like the highest bioavailability for nutrients, generally speaking. And, and stuff like that. And you you uh, show all this stuff on your Instagram, which I think is awesome to kind of give people a, a visual a visual of, of, of what you're doing with someone who's had a lot of oxalate issue in the past and continue to work on that. But what are some things we can do now to kind of taper because you don't want to just rip it all out of your system and then have all the potatoes and beetroot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Potatoes and beetroot, yeah. So yeah, because you don't want to turn on all the hazmat guys at one time. Yeah. You don't want them all to get super excited, like, yay, at last we can get rid of this stuff because the body didn't want it. So it's going to get, so you do want to go gradually, but start, like, if you're eating a lot of spinach, try to use lettuce. Arugula is low. Uh, arugula is one of the cabbage family vegetables. And as a group, the cabbage family vegetables, which is two thirds of the produce department, are low in oxalate or low enough to be way safer than the high ones. So the high greens are the spinach the beet greens and Swiss chard, which Swiss chard is basically a beet green without a beet. They're, they're I, believe, I believe kale and bok choy, I think they're quite low in oxalate, I believe. 
Their uh, bok choy is very low, and the kale, the kale is like 10 kinds of kale, right? Because we've invented all these different things. So the green curly kale is the highest of the kales, and the lowest is the, the lac lactinato or dino kale is the yes. lower one, which is the one that's like leather and tough and chewy, but it's cool, so people like it. I don't know why. I don't know why anyone likes kale. <laughs> no, totally. Yeah, no. Collards are less stringy, I think, and they're a little better. They're they're in the middle there somewhere. Not the greatest, but way, way better than spinach. But when you're buying these um, mixed mus masculine salad mixes, they have little baby beet greens because of the pretty red, yeah. and little baby Swiss chards because of the pretty red. Yeah. And they and the red Swiss chard is much higher than the white Swiss chard, and they're both ridiculously high. They're both higher than spinach. Swiss chard was the vegetable for me growing up, and all through, that was how I killed myself, really. <laughs> And the spinach. So those are easy things to get away from. I mean, even dandelion greens, which are not low, are much better choice over these other ones. So just sorrel. So there's four. There's the sorrel, Swiss chard, beet greens. One, one, where do, Move where do lettuce, lettuce and you've got it solved. What? Oh, yeah. So lettuces are like fairly low. Lettuces right? are very low. Romaine has like two milligrams or one per cup. Okay. And, and um, let's see, arugula has like three per two cups or, you know, it's just a little bit higher. Really different than 300 per cup. Yeah, and I believe I believe sweet potatoes are probably a better choice than regular potatoes. They're a bit more than oxalate. They're worse. They're worse. Well, no, I actually, but I didn't know that actually because I actually I was always told that oxalates were better through my nutrition course and things, which is pretty strange, but. That's the indoctrination side of things, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So there's lots of forms of white potato because it's another highly human handled food where we've developed, you know, hundreds mm. of types of potatoes, mostly yeah. originally from Peru, but they, they're worldwide. And um, white potatoes are pretty bad, but sweet potatoes are even worse, uh, partially because they are a little higher in the soluble oxalate than the potatoes. Yeah. But the, mm. in the potato department, you're much better to get away from the big baker potatoes in the U.S. Yeah. We call them Idaho potatoes. Yeah. They're also russets are similar. Russets and Idaho's are the worst. Those are the ones we make French fries with and often make potato chips with. They're very bad when you've concentrated the oxalate by dehydrating it in a potato chip. Like mm. potato chips are terrible. Um, yeah. But yeah. The, the little red skin, thin red skin potatoes are much lower in oxalate. So if you've got to have potatoes, get away from the big bakers yeah. and get the little red ones and use controlled portions. So we're talking dose here. We're talking quantities. So if you use smaller portions of the red potatoes, that might be a transition thing you can do. And then start using turnips, celery root, cauliflower, these, these low oxalate foods to make mashed potato sub, substitutes. And you can turn them into little fries in the oven and kind of get that experience of the potato product without the potato. Um, unfortunately, a lot of chips, like not just white potato chips, but now you can buy these mixed root chips with the beets yeah. and the the different colored potatoes and the red, white, the uh, sweet potatoes, they're terrible. Sweet potato chips are awful. Plantain chips are really high. Um, it's like one ounce is like 45 milligrams in a plantain chip. And they're really popular. So instead of plantain chips and banana chips, they're high. Let's quit snacking. Let's actually have meals for one thing. Let's eat real food and be honest about when we're eating. I think when we get into eating problems and weight problems and eating disorders, we're being a little bit unaware of mm -hmm. our behavior. And I, I think the snack foods and you go to the retail store, even it can be the hardware store and there's chocolate bars and there's peanuts and there's plantain chips and junkola right there at the checkout and just that impulse buy. Um, and that, I think that is also just increasing our exposure generally. And just so, you know, part of a diet change is to get real with yourself and, and have a plan, think ahead, be fed, and then be conscious in your choice making. You can't get off of fast foods and grab and go foods and really change to low oxalate very easily because you're having to use ingredients that just aren't cool. I mean, who thinks a turnip is cool? Yeah. You know? Me, me and Ryan have said this often, that awareness is the first step of changing any behavior and that's a part of the Yeah, yeah. So, there are plenty of vegetables that you could eat. The problem is, like Ryan was saying, if you do the nine cups a day deal on these 
um, cabbage family foods, you're, you're going to be so bloated and uncomfortable because rabinose and other junkola that's naturally part of the the kale and so on is not digestible by humans. You don't have a gorilla gut. And so down there in the colon, you're promoting the growth of bacteria that are going to make you feel terrible. And no one wants to feel bloated. It makes you tired. It makes you feel frumpy and just unpleasant. So the you cannot turn these cabbage vegetables into giant piles of staples and really feel healthy. Yeah, so where, you, where, go where, ahead. I was just going to ask, where do mushrooms kind of align on this spectrum? They haven't really tested a ton of mushrooms. And generally, your culinary mushrooms are fine and quite low. And so they're a great choice. You know, if you're home cooking, mushrooms are a great choice. But the chaga is quite high, probably. And there hasn't been enough tests to give us a really solid sense of how high they are and how much that varies. Because when you're talking about something living and growing, each one is unique and each growing condition is unique. And there's lots of variables that influence how much is in a food. So when we yeah. say spinach has 300 a cup, it's not 300.000. It's yeah. like, oh, well, somewhere between 250 and 500, you know, somewhere in that big ballpark is where spinach lands. It depends on all kinds of factors. Not all of them we know, but if the soil's too high in calcium or if there's a lot of, uh, weather pressure or predation pressure or whatever that the, it might go up or down. So we're talking ballparky. So it's really, uh, you, you have to sort of understand that the numbers we have for these foods are based on testing. And in order to really know what's in a food, we have to test and test and retest and keep testing and learn mm -hmm. about that food and know how variable it is. Right. So finally, somebody got around to doing this with avocados and found that a super ripe, very soft avocado only has about seven milligrams, but a firm, almost semi-ripe avocado has 50. So that's seven times higher depending on how ripe it is. So I mention all that because, you know, there are these nuances with it and there's a lot of misunderstanding and mishandling of data and there's a lot of bad data out there, but there, there are plenty of plant foods that you can eat and they're an important part of the transition. Um, but if you end up really sick with oxalate, you sometimes have trashed your gut and your immune system so much, you become hypersensitive and hyperreactive and you start reacting to a lot of foods. Your gut is just struggled for years. And so we tend to navigate or, you know, gravitate towards a more meat centric diet as part of wanting to feel better. And that can be an important phase eventually for people. But I really do not recommend like trying to overhaul your whole diet in life in a week or a month or a year even. You, you want to move in a natural progression as your mind, body, and lifestyle will allow you to comfortably journey forward in, in a way that's humane, in a way that's patient, in a way that's appropriate. I think that is a really important statement to kind of end this, yeah. this podcast on is kind of bringing it back to that kind of behavioral aspect of eating Mm -hmm. And kind of this dysbiotic relationship we have with eating as well, in general, just the way we, we focus around food. And I think that oxalate is something to really consider when, when you're dealing with many issues. I, I think that just in general, even if you're doing fine right now, I would probably limit them anyways, because you don't want to even give yourself the potential of Absolutely. developing things. So I, I really appreciate it. I know we like only scratched the surface. There's only so much we can do in an hour Definitely when we're doing it. One. <laughs> but I would I would love to have you back on and focus in on like one aspect, like the mental health aspect of the of the oxalate conundrum and all this stuff. Because I think mm -hmm. we could I'd I would i would like to get really substantive with you uh, at some time in the future. I think that'd be very fun and really insightful for our, our audience. Uh, this was a good kind of introduction to the overview of oxalates as a, as a potential problem that you're dealing with out there. So I appreciate you being here. Let everyone know where they can find you. Like I mentioned before, we, we have your website. It's awesome. Go check it out. She has definitely with the food lists. Yours is definitely the most helpful that I've seen cool. because yeah. there's so many contradicting food lists out there where I've read like, Oh, this food is fine. And then you find another list and like, it's not fine anymore. And so <laughs> I think, I think you have a great one. Yeah, well, there's a lot of technical things, and we should just mention that real quickly, that a lot mm -hmm. of the data generated before 1980 was just not right, because there's it's very difficult 
to test natural substances. They have thousands of chemicals in them. And something like vitamin C in a radish can turn into oxalate in the test tube as you're preparing your sample. And all of a sudden radishes are high in oxalate. They're not. You know, so the USDA data, for example, is really wrong. And many lists in textbooks, the nursing textbooks and so on, have at least five or six items that are completely backwards. They either shouldn't be on the high list or they should be, you know, it's just a mess. So yes, I've made an effort to try to get that right. So that's one of the hazards. Is, so check out the website. It's got a ton of free information. I'm doing group classes. You can sign up for them there. I am, I'll do more later once I finish the transcript for my book, which is going to happen soon. That's awesome. And you know, there's a cookbook there. People want to know how to cook vegetables. I got I don't know, 80, 80 vegetable recipes at least in my cookbook, which has nearly 200 recipes. So it's mostly in U.S. measures, but I've tried to provide a lot of metrics too. So you, you probably could muddle through no matter what measurement you use and find a lot of good tips in the cookbook and specific ingredients and how to work with them and even calculations of oxalate content. So that's plenty to get you started. You just have that little beginner's list in a couple recipes and you're good to go. You just have to have the fortitude to carry on. So check out the website, sallyknorton.com. On Instagram, I'm sknorton. And that's pretty much the main spots to find. Awesome. The um, last thing last thing actually just came up because you mentioned the vitamin C and I forgot to ask you earlier. Do you, like, would you recommend, like, is there a, it's very nuanced like you mentioned, but is there like, because too much vitamin C can turn into oxalate. Very is seriously, that, people get sick from that how much vitamin C would you say like for somebody is like maybe a safe range to supplement with if they are taking a supplement? I'm the guessing it's not a thousand million. Yeah, it's not a thousand. When you get into the grams, you're getting into the oxalate toxicity zone with C supplements, which is really mm -hmm. the LDA is rubbish. What? The LDA is absolutely rubbish, I think. Well, the RDA is around 90 or so. And um, it depends on how much... Um, carbs you eat. I, I think that's mm -hmm. perfectly fine on a moderate carb diet as under a hundred is, is more than adequate. I mean, cause the, the actual, like how much your cells really need, it can only absorb so much. So your, your white blood cells need some vitamin C to do their magic stuff and they pick it up and you need to have a kind of continuous supply of it. But any more than about three or 400, you can't, there's no more space to put it in. And then you get all this sloshing over. But the, the research suggests under 250 a day should protect you from excess of oxalate. And I really believe if you're on a moderate carb diet, you don't need more than about 100 a day. You really are okay. If, unless you're keeping a lot of carbs in your diet, you may need 150 a day. But if you need to supplement, it has to be in amounts like 50 to 100 two or three times a day. Now, when you're infected, when you have a real illness, you can go up to 100 four times a day, and that would be great, and you need it. You do need vitamin C, but it's also, it just degenerates into oxalate and it's toxic, and there's plenty of examples in the literature, and it creates also creates that deposition disorder where you get a backlog of oxalate building up in your body just from taking vitamin C.